Hello and welcome to Insight, a show where we have courageous conversations about social justice and the issues affecting the citizens of the region of Peel and beyond. I'm one of your hosts, David Barnwell, and I'd like to know if you've ever heard of resume whitening. According to a study recently published in March 2016 in the Toronto Star, resume whitening is the act of modifying one's professional resume to sound more white in hopes it will increase one's chances of actually getting a foot in the door and landing an interview. It's happening. It's right up there with what we would call carding, which seems to be happening and not just seems to be happening, but is quite widespread and has many advocates crying out against its practice. We're talking about systemic racism, and these are just two mere examples of such a horrendous topic. We're here with our wonderful hosts of Insight, Ranjit, Hardeep, and Anchal, as well as two very special guests, Alista and Jamal, who will share their authentic story. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being with us today, both of you. Uh, I know it takes a lot of courage to be here and speak out about some of your experiences. So, Jamal, I'd like you to start by sharing your experience of what we consider to be systemic racism. Okay. Well, my name is Jamal Mears, and I am 22 years old. I live in Brampton, and one of the situations that stick out at me is that there was one time I was driving back from the gym, and I was at the stoplight, and I could tell that there was a cop behind me, and I could tell that he was wa he was reading my plates. So, I turned left, just going going back home, and I could I had a feeling that he was like following me. So, I took the long way home, took the back roads, and he's still following me. And I'm trying to figure out like why is he still following me? And then he finally stops me, and then he's like, he's like, oh, where are you going? And I was like, I'm just going to McDonald's. And he's like. Why are you going this way? I was like, I don't, I, I don't know. I just wanted to go this way. And then he just said, slow down. It's, it's, it's raining out here. And then it was done. And I didn't, I didn't understand, but like, I don't, I don't understand why it happened, but. So you weren't speeding? Weren't speeding. You weren't wasn't, doing wasn't speeding. Like, I was in the back street, so I was going slow. There was a school zone, so. I was just trying to, I was, I was taking the back roads just to make sure that he was actually following me. Mm -hmm. And then he was, so yeah. And he didn't explain why? No, no reason. He just, his explanation was, oh, it was raining outside, so slow down. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you were sharing with me before that um, this had happened a number of times yeah. and you started uh, avoiding going a certain route yeah. because you knew that every time you went that route, you were being stopped. Mm -hmm. Can you share that with us? There was one summer that I would say every other week I would be getting stopped by cops just because I would. I have no idea why. I had a black Nissan and I would be driving on every street and I would be just be getting pulled over just because. And then there was one time that I was in a car with my friends and everybody had their seatbelt on and then he stopped us just because he thought that one of us didn't have our seatbelt on. And then that would happen, that happened throughout the whole summer. And ever since then, I'm, I'm like immune to it now. Like I'm used to it. And uh, there was one time that I got pulled over and then my friend was like, oh, like he was freaking out. And I was like, this is, this is regular to me now. Like I just got my stuff out. Was, and was there a specific area that this was happening in? Was it always in Brampton, a specific area in Brampton? It's really, there? it's really every, anywhere I'm driving. It's, it's not really a specific area, but... And, and the reasons they give you for pulling you over? It's always, it's always a stupid situation. Like, they always make up something like, oh, I thought his seatbelt was off, or something's wrong with your license plate, but nothing's wrong with my license plate. Mm -hmm. And that would happen all the time. And now, now that I noticed, like my dad got a new car, and now it's like beige, and I don't get pulled over as much. Oh, it's very you. weird. I don't know. So you reckon the color of the car? I guess so, because I don't get pulled over as much anymore. But so were the uh, were the windows tinted? Was there on was there the, the black one? Yeah. No, just a regular black Nissan, and I would just get pulled over all the time. 
Now, you were telling me also that um, there were times when you would be going home mm -hmm. and you would then do a detour yeah. and not go through the area where you were consistently yeah. being stopped. Yeah. Was that area, uh, was there a reason why that area was where the police were around all of the time and you were being stopped? There was, there's this um, street, Mavis Road, mm -hmm. and that's a street that I know and like everybody like my mom always tells me, like there's gonna be cops there. Mm -hmm. So at night times, especially, like I, I, I'll take the longer way just to avoid any situations, cause I don't, I don't, I don't want to deal with it if there's anything. So I just take the longer route all the time. Mm -hmm. Are there any other experiences that you've had? Um, it's just the regular pulled over for no reason, and then. They would try to say, like, I'm speeding, but I actually wasn't, and then... Do they ask for your license or identification at that point? License so they, they're basically looking to run a check on you. Yeah, basically. See. And then, like, if I'm, if I'm driving my mom's car, she has a RAV4, and they would stop me because they think, like, it's not my car, so whose car is it? And then they would just ask questions, and then mm -hmm. just regulate. Mm -hmm. At 22, mm -hmm. how many times do you think you've been stopped? more than 10 more than like and and it's always confusing to me when people say that they've never been pulled over like I don't even understand that because it happens all the time to me so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you've been you been driving for six years since roughly grade grade 11 so okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and so in that period of time you've been stopped 10 times Wow so Elise, I'll share with us a little bit of what you do and why you were drawn to this show. I am a spoken word poetess. I am also a speaker and a workshop facilitator. And the reason why I was drawn to this particular <laughs> episode was because as an artist, I believe that we are called to be able to document the times of what's happening in the world around us. And one of the things of being a part of a visible minority in the Peel region and growing up and being born in the Peel region, you are able to notice that certain things are happening to yourself, to your loved ones, to your friends. And um, being able to notice these trends that are happening and developing, my work has now be, been reflecting that. My work um, works specifically on themes of power and empowerment because of stories like Jamal's where you are hearing continually that we are becoming numb to the system that is created um, and being perpetuated by whatever ideals and standards we would like to say is attributing to this. So my art really is looking at the different ways in which culture is being appropriated and reinterpreted and the different impacts it has on, on a visual aspect. So. Um, for instance, what some of the work that I like to do is looking at how certain features of, the black, of a black person will be attributed to a white person, and they will not then deal with the same differences and difficulties that a black person would. Um, because for them, it's just a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. It's um, an aspect of beauty for them. Um, while for us, it's an aspect of beauty for us, however, it comes with certain stipulations and difficulties with it. So my art and my work really does reflect that and examine that whole structure. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, uh, a few weeks ago we had an artist um, who, who stated that as a native person, as an indigenous person, um, it wasn't until the truth and reconciliation that she was able to talk about her roots and that all of her artwork had not reflected her roots at all until the truth and reconciliation happened. And then she felt that she could speak about herself and that she had the dignity to reclaim who she was and who she was always afraid of being in a world where she was never really acknowledged or accepted. So do you feel that um, Coming to this place, coming to a place where you've now realized that you need to uh, reclaim um, your culture and your roots and your history through your uh, poetry, that it speaks to a lot of people who in the past did not have the strength or the courage to come out? Absolutely. 
Um, there is a lot of positive feedback that I have received in regards to the work that I do. I have one poem in particular called Tell Em, and it's um, a piece that really reflects my own personal experience as a young child in a primarily white school and just having that encounter. Um, the piece begins with the story of sitting in the first grade on the carpet and a little girl takes my hand into hers and she looks at it and she's wowed by the fact that one side looks like her and one side looks like me. And she's never encountered something like that before. And just deconstructing what that simple and very passive incident looks like and the impact it has on me now as an adult remembering that um, and just deconstructing that and understanding that I have been through a process of reclamation for myself and a process of empowerment for myself that I am now able to embody in my work and be able to share it with others and getting that feedback and response from other people whether it's after a show or whether it's from the response happening right then with the audience um, definitely people have let me know that that was what they needed at that moment or on a whole that certain pieces I've shared is what our community needs in that moment because there's so much destruction happening in a very quiet systemic way that um, you're slowly getting worn down and until you have a piece like a piece that I may present um, that really injects that form of empowerment you don't even realize that this wearing down process is happening well, how do you open that up to the masses, though? So I can imagine that your audience, when you're doing the spoken word type performance, that you know you have people who are your audience will consist of people who want to be there. That's not necessarily the same type of people that you may need to reach because those people aren't there, and mm -hmm. they may not either know about what you're doing or they may not, you know, want to be there. So how do we get your message out to the masses to be able to, uh, you know, open their eyes to the, the plights and the issues that are faced by your community? I think um, that it's a very good question, and I think it's twofold. Um, one part is for the people that are there, being able to engage with them and being able to impart a sense of empowerment, um, that they can leave feeling that sense of empowerment and sharing it with their community helps that to happen. The other part is also the fact that we need to understand the role of art in any form of movement, in any form of um, advocating for change and understanding the value behind it. It's much greater than a song or a dance or poetry. It is something that is infused with being an education point. Um, and getting that out to the masses um, is in part my job as an artist to ensure that I am creating videos, social media content, etc., to be able to reach the masses. But it's also up to our community to be just looking to access and reach out to artists, period understand the value of, of an artist and the role that we have as artists in being able to document the times around us. Mm -hmm. I think what's important also, uh, Hadeep, is that when you reach out, even if you're touching just the black community, those members that you're touching will go into schools, mm -hmm. will go into their workplace, will begin to talk about their experience a little bit more openly, mm -hmm. knowing that there's a whole crowd of you that are able now to move forward and have the strength and courage to do that. Yeah. So Jamal, for, for you now, in your own personal life, what do you do? I, I just finished, I just graduated school and now I work at Pizza Pizza on the promotions team. And also I have a, another job with a small company called Junior, I mean, Grandaholics as a junior A&R. And basically for that one, I would look for artists and set them up with licensing and publishing deals. Mm -hmm. And that's trying to get them money by putting out their music and placing it different places like documentaries, uh, shows, stuff like that. So do you feel that as people of, um, of color that you are reaching out to more people of color to empower them and to give them those opportunities that we may not have had before? Mm -hmm. Jamal, is that what you're doing? I would Do you say, feel that like, realistically, I don't try to, I, like, if the art is good, then I'm giving, I'm going to give you a chance. Like, I'm not going to just make it just black people right. or anything. So, right. like, to me, it's just art is art. Right. And if it's good, then other people should be, she, should be uh, seeing it, hearing it, sharing it. And that's how I see it. Right. And Alista? Um, it's definitely going back to Jamal's point of saying if something is good, you are going to give it to um, that opportunity to who it's um, rightfully due to. Um, I also think one of the things with that approach as well is 
it allows you to be able to get in front of audiences that need to hear the story, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the black community. Mm -hmm. um, systemic racism isn't perpetuated necessarily by the black community. Mm -hmm. It's it perpetuated by the society at large and by the systemic um, races that have been put in place to perpetuate it. Right. But it also so, goes beyond the black community as well. Of correct? course, of right. course, any visible minority. Yeah. Of yeah, and, and, and that's what, that's why you know that's what I sit here and I, I get frustrated with because I look at it and say we're in 2016 mm -hmm. here, right? The black community has been fighting since the 30s, the 20s, even probably even earlier than that to get this done, and we're still sitting here talking about the same issues. Absolutely, right? and, and yes. I think that's a part of why we, like for myself, for instance, um, as an artist, it's getting in front of whoever will listen yeah. because regardless of what your race is it's getting in front of you to under to help you understand that there needs to be a change that's happening in your me mentality there needs to be a change that's happening in your mindset in your semantics there has to be a change in how we are approaching these problems and solutions so as much as systemic racism will be altered and changed through policy it's really going to be fueled by society by people by mindset by language and that's what the artist does so our goal really should just be to get good art out in front of people who need to receive that message mm -hmm. so do you feel that uh, a lot of times the poetry and the art is talking about your experience and your experience is about systemic <coughs> racism and so there's more and more poetry uh, and more and more songs and lyrics that talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just one way of you being able to get out into the community to be able to share that. Absolutely. So your key message today, what is it, Elisa? My key message today is, to, is twofold. The first part is to understand the role of art and being able to advocate for change in our community, um, to value the art and the artist. Uh, the second part is that we are able to, as a society, overcome this. It's 2016. It's unfortunate that we, we are still dealing with so many of these issues. But because it's 2016, it means that we are more educated than ever. We are more resourced than ever, and we can actually overcome this. So we're going to remove all the barriers that have prevented you from being able to move forward. Okay, and for you, Jamal? For me, it's, it's, it's like not, not to be ignorant with with the fact that it still exists mm -hmm. and that we need to make a change. Like it is 2016, it's time that we all come together and solve this problem that's been going on for years, decades, centuries. Like it's time that things need, like I shouldn't be stopped just because I'm black. Like there's so much problems that could be simply avoided, but they don't. So now it's time to we gotta, we gotta make the change. So now we're calling out to institutions to acknowledge that there needs to be change and they have to be the agents of change, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for being with us today thank and you. we really appreciate your voice and for sharing that voice with us. Thank you. And we're going straight to Play Matters and we'll be right back in just a moment, so stay tuned. <laughs> and welcome to Play Matters. Today we're going to be talking about accountability. Accountability can be defined as taking ownership of one's actions. It is important to teach children that every action has a positive or a negative outcome or a consequence on themselves and others. Though it may seem like it, cooking is a great way of demonstrating accountability to young children. Our special guest here is Carson and Carson is going to be choosing the ingredients and he wants to make a sandwich. So Carson, everything out here for you is make a sandwich and I'll be eating it, and from there we can tell about the taste. Can I make it now? You can make it now. So he's grabbing a donut. We're gonna make a donut sandwich. Okay, we're grabbing some cheese. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Let's see some lettuce. Spicy salami, okay, not bad. What else are you gonna put? Some bugles. Okay, so that was bugles. So we have like sliced salami, some lettuce, some cheese, gummy bears. There we go. It's a gummy bear. And what else? Mm. Oh yeah, I can't forget the cookies. You can't forget those cookies, no. right? Two of them? <laughs> this is even falling apart on me and everything. Okay, Christina, looks like one good sandwich there. 
So wait, can I eat the cookie after? No. Yeah. Can I eat the cookie after? How are you supposed to eat like this? Eat one cookie, cookie after. Okay, I promise you one cookie after. A little cherry on top. This little cherry on top. Awesome. Wait, I'm supposed to eat my sandwich now. Now I can go. Okay. Enjoy. Thanks, man. Okay, so we have here just quickly reiterate everything. We have bugles. We have a donut with spicy salami cheese. Yeah. And lettuce. And lettuce. Okay, awesome. Okay. So ready? I will eat the gummy bears after I promise. Ready? One, two, three. Not even putting anything in my mouth, eh? <laughs> okay. It's a little Chicken. sweet, spicy. Good. It's healthy too, actually. I really enjoy it's that. healthy. Okay. So while Christine is eating the meal, um, I want to guys let you know that whether the meal tastes good or bad, Carson has learned that his actions and decisions have consequences. And in this case, the taste of the meal. It is important to teach children about accountability because it promotes children to understand taking responsibility for their actions, ownership when making decisions, and to learn to justify their behaviors. Teaching your child something as simple as cooking allows your child to learn more about accountability in the sense of no matter what happened or who started a task, everyone has a responsibility and a part in the role they played and how their behaviors influence the situation. Children will also learn skills such as measurement and cause and effect. So thank you, Carson. Thank you, Christina, for eating uh -huh. that sandwich. <laughs> and thank you for watching Play Matters. Thank you and welcome back to Insight and our show now is on the research segment of systemic racialized discrimination. Our two guests with us now are Howard Morton and we have Anthony Morgan and both of them are lawyers and both of them have a lot of experience dealing with systemic racialized discrimination. So Howard, can I start with you please and share with me um, what systemic racialized discrimination is to you and how you've seen it be reflected in cases around you. Sure. Maybe I can start by talking a little bit about the practice of carding, which I'm sure most people have heard. The province of Ontario, after months of consultation last week, brought forward a regulation which is aimed at preventing the practice of carding. Regrettably, the regulation only applies where an officer is approaching a person, and as you know, they're generally speaking persons of color, young people in particular, young black males, uh, to be further particular. It only applies if the officer's approach is for the purpose of attempting to get identifying information, which is not adequately defined in the regulation. This regulation demonstrates what happens when the government attempts to regulate a practice that is illegal. Mm -hmm. Carding, or more properly referred to as street checks, violate both the Charter of Rights, the fundamental law of Canada, and in many instances violate the Human Rights Code. So that officers under this regulation can still stop law-abiding people approach them, psychologically detain them, ask them all sorts of questions as long as they don't ask for identifying information. If they're going to take that extra step, they have to give a caution, what we call a caution, and give a receipt uh, after. There's also some accountability mechanism uh, in the regulation, and the regulation is a small step forward, but I want to emphasize how small it is because it's not going to stop the practice of street checks. Street checks are a very small part of racial profiling, of racial discrimination. But they are one area where people can mobilize to convince the authorities, including the police, that racial discrimination, racial profiling, uh, certainly in terms of interactions between the government or a government agency and members of the public, must stop now. We've had decades of studies and research done demonstrating that the problem prevails, particularly in the justice system, which Anthony and I are involved in, and yet nothing has done. We move in these small steps, but it's time now for people to mobilize, 
get on to your members of parliament, your local MPPs, your councillors, to put an end to racial profiling on the part of the police. And I must say that uh, I'm from Toronto, I'm not from Peel, and quite frankly, uh, when I first attended with Ranjit at Appeals Police Service Board and heard the, the statistics that prevail in Peel, I was quite shocked. They're far worse in terms of racial profiling than we have in Toronto. So that's just one tiny part of racial profiling. Uh, there are all sorts of other parts that I'm sure Anthony will address, but carding is the one area where I'd like to see people mobilize further. And I agree with you. I think um, when we're looking at systemic racialized discrimination, it isn't just one aspect. It's a combination of many different aspects within institutions that disadvantage people of color, right? So Anthony, share with us some of your stories. Yeah, and so I, I would actually like to pick up with what Howard was talking about. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about systemic uh, discrimination or, or systemic racism, what we're talking about are policies and practices that don't outright say these people are bad or uh, target these particular people. It's usually coded in a very neutral, seemingly uh, uh, objective language, but the way in which these policies and practices are operationalized, they have a disproportionately negative effect on a particular group. And so we see that with, with carding where there's nothing in there uh, as a practice generally, or it's not written to say go after these people. Mm -hmm. It's just developed as a process in the way policing is done. Uh, and it's had a, a negative impact on young black men and other uh, racialized young people. But we do also see it in other systems. So if we look at uh, our education system, for instance, when we look at suspensions, expulsions, and also the streaming of young people into certain uh, levels of academic uh, uh, capability, you see that those outcomes are also racialized, right? And again, this is systemic racism because it's not, uh, it's not often the case where you'll have a teacher, it's actually quite rare where you'll have a teacher or an administrator say explicitly, th these kinds of students are less uh, intellectually capable. You, you're not, you don't have those kinds of things uh, as much. They're extremely rare. But what you do have is a practice that is developed within our schooling systems that frankly, if you look at the outcomes of who is graduating, who is getting uh, post-secondary education, who is succeeding and who is dropping out, and who is not uh, excelling within the system, you do see these practices manifest. And it is a part of uh, systemic racism where uh, you have a color-coded uh, graduation regime if you look at, at who gets to go on and who doesn't. And so that's another area in which we see uh, systemic uh, practices where, again, it's not written that any particular people are, are bad or less than, mm -hmm. but the outcomes start to show that. You'll, you'll often see black people, uh, brown people, racialized folks uh, who, are, who are at the, the, the lower ends of these things. But it also manifests in, manifests in child welfare systems as well. So if you look at the practice of police, teachers, uh, medical professionals who will end up making calls to children's aid societies, often it is for racialized people, black and brown people within our cities, whereas for other communities, uh, individuals aren't as quick to make those calls. Mm -hmm. They will look at other alternative measures to support family members, often when it is a white family who fits within uh, an idea of what a, fa a typical family should look like or the typical things a family should have. So again, within, within child welfare systems, it's not that it's written anywhere that a particular kind of family or, or certain racialized backgrounds are, are less than, but systemic racism is that functioning where out of s different attitudes, prejudice, uh, ideas, stereotypes that we've developed, negative ones about certain groups, that causes actions that result in uh, negative outcomes for, for different peoples. And it's often, again, uh, black, brown, and, and we'd say uh, indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And I think when we look at um, the disproportionate representation in correctional services, yeah. in jails, um, and as you mentioned with suspensions, they're not going to say, okay, we did it because you were colored. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to say that. But if a system is set up that there is that disproportionate representation, then there clearly has to be a significant um, understanding that the impact that the actions are bringing about has disadvantaged these people. So we need to revisit them and we need to make change. And I think 
that's where a lot of the, the issues are, is that people see within the institutions the unfair representation of racialized people in certain areas. But there seems to be no um, claiming of, of that responsibility to actually make change. So what should we be doing in order to bring institutions, and I think you alluded to this, Howard, is that we need to get out there. We need to be um, pushing for change. Um, and whether that's you know, connecting with politicians or whether it's advocating uh, for change. How, how, else does that, you know, how else does that happen? What do we have to do in order to push those institutions to bring about that change? Well, that, that's what makes systemic racism so insidious. As Anthony says, it's not a bunch of officers, in the case of the police, or right. children's aid workers, okay. or teachers saying, we're going to treat these blacks somehow different. It's, but it's built into the system. Right. And in terms of the police, it's sort of part of the whole blue line uh, thinking. So the only way you can get groups like the police or children's aid to change, I think, is to make them confront that issue from within. Because we can uh, yell and demonstrate as much as we want, but until there's motivation within those institutions, it's not going to change. So the question really is, I think, how do we make those institutions realize it's in their best interest to put an end to systemic racism within whatever particular field they're in? But Howard, is it actually systemic, or is it just part of the way society is at this point as a whole. Because when you take a look at the supporters of carding versus the people who are against carding, no pun intended, it's black and white, right? It's, it really comes down to that. And while there are some few on, on each side, it, it really comes down to that separation. There's people of color on one side saying, you know, this is a problem, we're highlighting it, right? And then you have the other side where people are saying, well, it's a tool, it's a tool. If you take this tool away from the police, you know, the, well, how are they then going to be able to do their job to the, to, the, uh, to the fashion that they're doing it currently? So how do we go about, I mean, and, and this is my opinion on it, it's, it's a monumental sh uh, change in the way society looks at these matters and not just a systemic issue with the police organization or with ch children's aid or the educational systems that needs to really be changed. But, but that's the funny thing because you're, you're quite right uh, initially uh, it was people of color versus people, middle class, white people, mm -hmm. pro and anti-carding. However, as there was more and more publicity about it, uh, primarily in the Toronto Star, the last poll showed that 61% of all of the residents polled in Toronto mm -hmm. opposed the practice of carding. So there is a way of getting the message out. The question is, how do we best do it? How do we mobilize? How do we make institutions realize it's in their interest to change? And how do we make our neighbors understand we all want to be safe, we want a police presence in our neighborhood, we want to trust the police, but it's the manner in which you police us that exhibits the racial discrimination inherent in, in policing, for example. So well, the, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, well, I think a large part of the problem adding to that is the fact that we've been, over the years, we're brainwashed to feel this way through the media. Exactly. And that's where all the stereotypes are coming from, when you're constantly seeing racialized groups of people are always the ones getting in trouble with the law. They're always the ones who are being stopped, and they're always the ones up to no good. We're feeding into this this mindset of as you go older, oh, there's a group of colored folks in that corner, they must be up to no good. Yeah. And, so and why do we always think that status quo is okay? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So yeah. we have to challenge the status exactly. quo because that is the policy, the process, the protocol, the operation. And until we challenge that, nothing's going to change, yeah. right? Otherwise, they're going to stay with exactly the way they are exactly. because it, it's threatening. Can you imagine, you know, being in a system for 50 years and everything is all hunky-dory and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of racialized people that have arrived in the last 20 and now we're going to have to change? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because we're here, right? Yeah. But tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you, you know, in terms of making that change. Well, I think one of the critical things that that means is looking at leadership uh, and looking at how we change uh, questions of, of who is leading which institutions, right? And what outcomes have resulted when you have, for instance, 
white middle class, often men running institutions, it seems that, or statistics play out for themselves, that it, it's overwhelmingly disadvantageous to the vast majority of us. And that doesn't mean that no white person can ever lead or they could ever mm -hmm. be uh, capable or competent. That's not the point. The point I'm making, though, is that if we were to diversify our leadership structures, make them more equitable, still having uh, the, the top quality of folks from, from every background, I would, I think, and many researchers have, have uh, demonstrated that uh, you would see more equitable outcomes, uh, whether it be in education, whether it be in employment, whether it be in child welfare. There are precedents out there, I think, often within Canada in particular, we're not willing to confront and face the fact that we do have color-coded outcomes that are racially biased. We think that multiculturalism has solved everything. Uh, and because we have this policy, and because we're not as bad as America, then everything can, can be all right. And we can point to individual examples and say, oh, things aren't so bad for women because we have Chief Evans, who's the, the head of the police force. Or things aren't so bad for black people uh, within Toronto because you have a Chief Slowly uh, out there. Or, or, uh, and there are other examples like this. But again, if we look at the outcomes themselves, uh, if we look at in these very particular uh, examples that I just um, I made, uh, you're not seeing that that always translate. And so it's not just about having a person uh, from a, a minority background, but someone who is uh, influenced and, and willing to make those courageous uh, moves to step forward and advance equity in meaningful ways, looking at those outcomes that we've seen and wanting to change them ultimately. Mm -hmm. That takes leadership. And I think looking at professional development, you know, and making sure that everybody understands what anti-oppression means and understands what change can look like and the effect of that change, right? And I, I think a critical piece for me is how do we begin to inspire leaders to become leaders for all of us and not just to maintain the status quo, right? You convince you, them it's in their interest. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the status of women 30 years ago in mm -hmm. terms of boards of directors of, of corporations, mm -hmm. Today, there are far more, not just because they're women, because corporations realize, holy smoke, you know, our board's going to be an awful lot better with that point of right. view and this point of view. Right. You have to convince institutions right. so your that final it's in their best is. interest. That's, that's my final point. Convince them it's in their best interest, because it clearly is. And sometimes it has to be by pressure, Yes, right? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. In terms of final message? Yes, please. Uh, I would say, ultimately, that we have to work to hold our leaders uh, accountable. And we have to familiarize ourselves with some of the institutions that are out there and call them out and, and use them to leverage the kind of changes that we want to see. So we have, for instance, the NDP government who's calling for the implementation of the anti-racism secretariat, which is in the Ontario Human Rights Code. And then we also have uh, the, uh, the anti-racism directorate that the Liberal government has just announced. Now, the directorate that, the, that is going to be in place offers a lot of opportunities to address systemic racism. Uh, the secretariat as well, but the secretariat hasn't fully been taken up and actually implemented. So I think these are important mechanisms that all of us should know about and be able to point to and say, well, government leaders, what are you doing to set this up or make this an institution that is valuable, that will change outcomes in the various areas of social life? So that it isn't just a token. Yes. But it's actually going to bring about the change. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank We've you. had courageous conversations and we're going to continue with them, so keep in touch with us. And we're going to our uh, artists now, our artist of the week, and we'll be right back, so stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome, Malika, and it's fantastic to have you here. Um, I know you're a comedian mm -hmm. and you're an attractive, amazing <laughs> black woman. Oh. Um, so I'm thrilled for you to be here. Thank you so I'd much. like you to share what you do. Okay, wonderful. Well, but first of all, thank you so much for having me. I've heard a lot about your show and your program, so thank you so much. Appreciate that. I'm honored. And the compliments are always good. Yeah. Well, as a <laughs> queen, off, right? as a speaking queen. to a queen, <laughs> right, Rani and Malika. Right. Okay, both from our Jamaica. Names, yeah, both our names mean queen. Right. That's amazing. Um, but like, where I'm from, you know, it's sort of a difficult question. It should be an easy one, but it's difficult mm -hmm. because it depends on who's asking. 
right? If I go into work in a, you know, non-ethnic sort of environment and, you know, cute little white girl, oh, where are you from? I feel nervous because I don't want to say Scarborough, you know, because the last time I told somebody I was from Scarborough, she's like, oh my God, booyaka, booyaka. So what does that just, mean? Did you just say <laughs> booyaker? Like, what is booyaker exactly? But, you know, she was imitating, you know, that Jamaican uh, style. Like, booyak, booyak. And I was like, oh, But awkward, isn't it, isn't right? it great uh, as a black woman mm -hmm. being able to tell black jokes? Oh, yeah. And people actually getting them, right? <laughs> it's I know growing up in England, it was really hard because I never understood the jokes. Oh, okay. I just never understood the white sense of humor, the right. English sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I come here and it's different again. It's, it's so it different. takes a Russell Peters to be able to tell Indian jokes mm -hmm. about Indian people that mm -hmm. I can relate to that right. make people laugh. Yeah. And that's what you do. I love doing that. I love doing it. I actually call myself the Jafakin. Mm. Right? Because um, I was born here in Toronto, yeah. but my parents are from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. But I've always had this strong identity with Jamaica. So even from I was six years old, mm -hmm. like if you would ask me where I'm from, I'm Jamaica, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I say, yeah. we're in Jamaica. Like, yeah. I've never been there, but yeah. as a six year old, um, Kingston? I was like, oh, okay, and where in Kingston? Yeah. Yeah. Um, around the Scarborough Town Center area. <laughs> Just confused, you know, yeah, so we have a little sure. identity crisis. Um, so, you know, it's awkward when someone asks you where, where you're from. You know, because now it's February, you know, Black mm -hmm. History Month. Mm -hmm. I get really to my roots, you yeah. know. So if you ask me yeah. now where I'm yeah. from, I'll give you the ancestor. Hey, I am from Africa. You are from Africa too. <laughs> Don't ask me where I'm from. Hey, 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 Charlie, Africa. <laughs> and, and that's the amazing piece, yes. is that you're connecting with a really diverse community mm -hmm. now, right? Mm -hmm. Because as we grow up together, we're understanding where we're coming from, mm -hmm. from each other. Right. The accent, the language, yes. the, the words that we're using. And, and that's really neat. It's fun. It's really, really it's fun. neat. It's fun. Yeah. I have fun with the, you know, the white folks at my, at my workplace all the time, mm -hmm. you know, because they'll make, I used to wear the long weaves and stuff. And I'd come, like, my hair would be this short when I, I like, one day. And the next day, we'd be down to, and right. they'll be like, change it oh every day. Oh, my gosh. Like, your hair. Is it, is it real? Can I touch it? Mm. No, I'm not a chief. They don't know how I feel. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much for having me. And of course, you can get more jokes on my channel at MalikaBrice.com. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. <laughs>
Im impact that change within the institution? Well, I think that's one way, certainly, in which it can be done. Um, there are many different um, opportunities for advocacy, right. as you know. Um, I think there is advocacy that doesn't bring us within the legal realm that can be very effective. But at the same time, there are times when the tool that needs to be used to move things forward is to bring an application, is to start a legal action of some sort. Um, and that's where we can be of assistance, mm -hmm. of support uh, in every facet of that application, whether it's assisting with drafting the application, whether it's uh, at mediation before the tribunal or at hearing. Um, and particularly when we're talking about change, uh, it comes down to, I think, what remedies can we sort of um, press forward to affect a lasting change? Um, and in doing so, yes, you are calling the respondent or the organization to the mat to take a good hard look at their practices and at their policies. And we're also making suggestions on you know, various things that they may not be attuned to, because that's one of the issues with uh, systemic discrimination. It may be a pattern of um, operation that the organization doesn't even really recognize that they've fallen into. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is to force these organizations to take a really strong look at their practices, at their policies, at their culture, at their behavior, and um, where necessary, bring in outside um, assistance to help them really shake things up. Because I think, you know, as you mentioned in the, uh, as your guest mentioned in the last segment, we become complacent. And, uh, and, and that doesn't sort of help us to break out of the change. And what I think many of these organizations need is an opportunity to sort of say, okay, wait, what are we doing that's continuing to affect a particular segment of the population in an adverse way? And how can we make changes, lasting changes, so that the benefit is for all? And so we're all sort of, you know, the, the notion of an inclusive organization that truly represents those that the organization serve. And I think that's the real challenge to move for in moving forward. And I think that's where the questions come up, right? Is when you've got diversity in the people that you serve, but it's not reflected in the way you do your business, in the way you conduct yourself, in the way you address the issues as they come up, then clearly there's going to be a conflict. And that's that conflict right. is what gives rise to a lot of the um, imbalances. That's right, right? that's right. So, uh, Elise, also coming back to you, um, you do a lot of grassroots work. Mm -hmm. um, so, share with us some of the grassroots work that you do, uh, that you do, that really does begin to address um, some of the issues of imbalance. I think it's really um, a process of education. So that is of both <coughs> the generation coming up, the present generation, and the generation before us. Um, and that has to happen in many different capacities. So some of the work I do sometimes is just as simple as sharing a particular piece in a church that's able to reach and access a whole various assortment of generations. Um, really opening up the eyes to all of those generations sitting in the same place that we are all encountering the same exact issues. So having that awareness is a first step towards change. Um, I think the second part with that as well is having real and honest conversations, much like this one, with the generation that is in power right now to be able to advocate for those changes, to be able to work for organizations, much like Charmaine does, to be able to get into those channels to create the policy necessary to be able to advocate for the change we need. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of that is actually the education aspect of getting into schools, getting into nonprofit organizations, getting into avenues where children are and accessing them while they are still malleable. And that's one of the things I love doing with the work that I do is being able to do these talks, being able to do these workshop facilitations to get in there and really build their identity as being multifaceted and intersectional and understanding that you are much more than just a race that is applied to you by society's standards. And you're much more than the stereotypes that are as attributed to that race because there's a lot of empowerment in 
your racialized experience if you choose to find it. And it's very simple for that to be lost um, through the society that we live in. So getting into schools, educating students, educating people, but also educating their families and their parents and helping them to understand how to be advocates for themselves, be advocates for their children, and be able to create these systems within their own home um, through language, through um, reward systems, to be able to encourage them um, to understand that what happens to them isn't necessarily a reflection of who they are or the value that they have. Mm -hmm. So in the, in, in the work that both of you do, I think the end goal would be for organizations that you work with and that you know are brought to you with issues become proactive and become proactive to see to, to notice the issues on their own and be able to correct mm -hmm. the issues on their own so are you seeing um, uh, any type of shift from organizations from being reactive into a proactive uh, um, regarding these matters you know I think change is coming but I think that if you consider that the issues that we're dealing with have been entrenched, you know, as mm -hmm. I think Jamal says, for years, for decades, for centuries, we have to keep at it. Mm -hmm. That really is, I think, the message that I'd like to leave everyone with. Mm -hmm. We must continue to work at it. This isn't a problem that's going to be solved, mm -hmm. you know, with those of us who are here tonight. Um, and it's not a problem that's going to be solved, uh, you know, with the change of, you know, a black uh, chief of police mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Toronto. But it's going to take time. He is part of a system. Mm -hmm. And so he's only one person in that system. And so it will, you know, it'll evolve over time. We just have to figure out a way to, um, to continue to get them to engage to continue to get them to look within, to try to recognize the instances in where, where they fall down, take ownership of them, mm -hmm. and make necessary change. That's mm -hmm. really what's required. And so nothing's going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I think it's the, but we really have to stay the course and keep the fight. And I think that ties really well back into what we were talking about on the last episode about um, disabilities and this conversation doesn't need to just happen with folks who are who are experiencing disabilities or who are part of that kind of circle the conversation needs to be happening with everybody regardless of race and color and we need to kind of create this unity and that's really where the change will come so it's not just and it's about building and allies right mm -hmm. it's about building allies it's about um, you know the black movement now right black lives matter um, it's about black people speaking up about black issues, but it's also about other people speaking. in the community speaking up mm -hmm. about their experiences and their own experiences, right? And beginning yeah. to make that change happen, but supporting mm -hmm. those movements because mm -hmm. the movements come out of a place of pain mm -hmm. and anger. And every single person that comes out of a place of pain and anger needs a voice. So if we can provide them with that voice in whatever format it is, whether it's through poetry, through arts, whether it's through the Human Rights Legal Support Center, or whether it's through uh, a venue, uh, you know, whether it's a play, or whether it's uh, in an institution, I think an institution can recognize when people are angry and when they're upset and when they're not happy, okay? And they may speak with their feet, leave the place and move on. And it's usually a reflection of the senior leaders and the senior staff, and that's why people will leave. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to make sure that we keep a community of harmony within an institution, we've got to be able to invite all of those voices to the table and listen to them and act. Because if we don't act, then listening is useless. Right? So if we can make a commitment in our own frames, in our own places, to actually be able to go out and impact the people that we do touch, that we can touch in our own way, to begin to ask for that change, to begin to bring those issues and those conversations to the table, then change will happen. Mm -hmm. And I think every single one of us here and every single one of the people that we connect with if we can inspire them, just like Molly 
inspires the students as a public speaker, being blind, but still being out there and still speaking about disabilities and still being able to talk to those issues. I think the time is right, right? I think because we've got legislative changes, there are going to be changes and people are willing to listen. And if we can be at that table to be that voice, to be that moderate voice of change, then people won't feel threatened. I think when they feel threatened is when we just come out and we're angry. And, but every person that's been in a place of harm is going to be angry. And that angry voice needs to be at the table too. Sorry, Angel. I was going to say, it's, we're heading towards it. You can see it just through the changes that are being made, even just in the government that we have and how they're trying to reshape all of the conversations happening. Yeah. So it's coming. It's really just how do we take it one step further? How do we make this happen faster? Because it's like, again, like you're saying and how Jamal is saying, these conversations have been happening for centuries mm -hmm. now. And it's mm -hmm. about time that... In the previous know, segment, uh, you know, one of the guys was talking about you know, the Peel School Board and you know, how, how, you know, suspensions and, and, and different items that are affecting you know, people of color. And I know that right now they've, they've created and they've had a few meetings over the last few months, one of them which I attended, w about diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, and so the, the school board itself, it was a group of principals from, from all around Peel who had gathered and they were discussing you know, issues of, of equity, inclusion, and diversity within their, within their schools and trying to get rid of the mindsets that, that maybe are, have been engraved, in, engra uh, engraved on the, with them over the course of time, not even realizing that they're perpetuating you know, uh, some type of... Uh, uh, okay. So we have one minute for a final message. Can we start with you, Elisa? Just your final message. My final message would definitely be that change is coming as long as we are willing to be the change makers within our own space and being able to work together as allies and advocates for one another. Amazing, thank you. Shall and I, I would say that we are in a wonderful period of time where we're seeing a lot of courageous people. Courage to speak up, mm -hmm. um, not just to your community, but to anyone who is willing to affect change. And within the institutions, courage uh, and the government courage to sort of really make lasting change courage to say okay yes we will deal with this now and i think it's on all of us to encourage that sort of change i agree thank you so much for coming today our conversation has been inspiring for me to have so many people that are willing to be a part of that voice and be the leadership that needs to bring that change about so thank you for joining us today, and we'll be right back next week. So make sure you come back and join us. And now over to David. Thanks, Reggie. I almost feel like a broken record this season. I've said it so many times before in some of our other episodes. It's 2016. There's no need for us to continue with things like street checks. There's no need for us to continue fostering systemic racism. It's 2016. We are all one big family on this planet. And if you want to take part, make sure you check us out on our Facebook page Towards Social Justice. Reach out to your members of parliament or your MPPs. Write them a letter. Tell them you're not okay with things like carding and that Massive reform needs to continue to happen and be solidified. Follow us on Twitter at TowardsSJ. And again, on behalf of the hosts here at Insight, keep having those courageous conversations.